Hello and welcome to the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. In this episode, I'll be talking to Lawrence Romine. He's the Vice President of Corporate Marketing at Altium. He's a Naval Aviation veteran with 24 years of experience in the high-tech industry and has held numerous design engineering, sales, and marketing positions across the consumer electronic space, semiconductor, and EDA industries. We'll be talking about the future of manufacturing and engineering and how it will affect engineers. I'm your host, Jeff Perry. I'm the founder of More Than Engineering, helping engineering and technology professionals with leadership and career coaching to create meaningful careers and lives. And this is the Engineering Career Coach Podcast brought to you by EMI, the first podcast dedicated to helping engineers and technical professionals with both their personal and professional development. Now it's time to jump into the main segment of our episode. I'm so excited to have with me Lawrence Romine. Lawrence, welcome to the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Absolutely. So Lawrence, you are the Vice President of Marketing at Altium. Can you tell us a little bit about what Altium is? And we want to know kind of in your own words, what life looks like for you and kind of where you've come from your how i ended up on the dark love side to, love to hear that yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah. sure um well i look i I'll, maybe i'll start with since you asked i'll just i'll go in the order you asked so we'll, we'll talk about just quickly who altium is so altium uh is from the, the electronics uh juggernaut of hobart tasmania australia uh is very remote place um been around about 35 or 36 years now um, but one of the uh, one of the pioneers, if you will, in the printed circuit board CAD space, um, we bumped around a really long, uh, excuse me, for quite some time as um, sort of an unknown player. Um, but as of late, and when I say as of late, in the past um, sort of 10 years in a major way, but 15 years overall, we've slowly but surely assumed the dominant position in this space. So we make design tools for printed circuit board designers and engineers and, and really um, dominate that space today. That's awesome. That's awesome. So how did you get into this industry and you know what's your background in, in right. So I call it the dark here. yeah I called it the dark side, Jeff. And so um, <laughs> what intrigued me about your your podcast uh, was it was it seemed to be geared towards younger people and career advice for people in engineering. So my story is a bit very similar, I'm assuming to yours. I don't know your story, but I have to assume you're like most of the engineers that I know, um, and that you probably knew at a fairly early age that this was kind of your path and this was your calling. And I was absolutely no different. Um, my father was an electrical engineer. I guess you could say he still is, he's still with us. Um, and you know, there's a book out there that's called um, uh, Everything I Ever Needed to, to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And um, <laughs> I use that a little bit tongue in cheek as everything I ever needed to know I learned in the garage um, from my father. So, you know, he was a troubleshooting kind of guy. I mean, I remember we had a Heath kit oscilloscope um, outside in the garage. I'm, I'm 48. So to put you in perspective, he was an early adopter of um, all things electronic computers. So I had a computer. I remember I had a TRS-80. I'm sure you don't even know what that is, Jeff. No, nope. um, it was a, it was a Radio Shack brand computer you could buy. Um, it would compete nice. with the Apple IIe. Uh, anyway, I had one of those in shoot probably 1982. Uh, then quickly had an IBM clone when those became available. And then everything else, uh, my passions were cars and motorcycles. And you know, I built my first motorcycle with my dad in the garage, probably eight years old, nine years old, and then quickly a car. And then that turned into many cars. And that turned into a lifelong passion. So that said, engineering, uh, troubleshooting, um, all things sort of technology were of an interest to me my entire life. And then in the, the, the late 80s, I saw that movie Top Gun. My father had um, gotten, gotten me some exposure to private uh, planes. Um, and I saw that movie and, you know, given all my experience with electronics and my passion in electronics and in mechanics, I said, look, that's something I want to do. And smash cut to the 90s. I joined the Navy and got into F-14. So I, I did uh, avionics for F-14s. 
And that led me into a career in uh, electrical engineering. Now, that said, my aspirations, Jeff, were always much more geared towards the business end of things. So I, I worked in as a pure play engineer for about four years. And then had a guy that was calling on me. He was um, a, a semiconductor sales rep selling uh, specifically Xilinx components. So FPGA, CPLDs, those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, this guy showed up wearing a fancy suit. He wore suits in those days. Um, <laughs> he had a nice looking car. And, you know, he was always taking me out to a nice lunch. And, you know, seemingly he didn't do much. Um, but, you know, sort of glad hand and, and, and generally be a nice guy, help me out when I needed something. Um, and I was like, well, what is it you do exactly? And, and so he explained <laughs> it to him and he says, well, you know, we're looking for, for people uh, that were to get into sales, the sales into things that are engineers. And I think you'd be ideal you know, when we make an introduction and the rest is history. Um, mm. So my whole career for the most part uh, as an engineer has been in the business end of things. So I was... Uh, sales and, and support of Xilinx components for about six years. Uh, I got into um, uh, the uh, software business here at Altium, and I've been here 19 years, and I just love it. Just love it. So started as a sales guy, been an applications engineer, been a marketing person, and now vice president of marketing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe engineers and marketers and salesmen can get along sometimes. Is that, is that what you're telling me? Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult to loathe yourself, Jeff. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I seem to think it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, well, that's, that's quite a journey. And, and uh, it's interesting with the, the latest Top Gun movie that, that came uh -huh. out. I, I've seen multiple stories online of, of more people that got into aerospace or avionics yep. or other things there. Um, I, I'm curious to see if, if anyone has collected the data, how many people, like if there was a boon of aerospace, you know, people over the next few years after that movie came out, because I'm sure it influenced many. I suspect uh, it probably did. Yeah, yeah. I assume yeah. It, it probably did. And, and interesting enough, my F-14 experience was actually here in San Diego at Top Gun. So mm. it, it really was the fulfill. It really was. Um, it, it was just a, it, it was a dream come true for me. It really was. It really was. Yeah. And, and, and engineering for me has, has really, as I said to you, Jeff, and I suspect much of your audience and yourself, probably very similar. It was something that was a calling. It, I really view it as a lifestyle. I mean, all those things I talked about are still the things I do for fun today. I have a car and I have motorcycles that I do in my garage, um, you know, tinker with stuff. And, and, um, and it's just been a, a real nice career for me. It really, really has. It's been really great. That's great. That's great. So, so let's get into talking to some, some fun stuff here. So uh, being that, that you work across um, a lot of different types of engineering businesses, you have a, you know, with the software that you and your company um, mm -hmm. uh, deliver, you probably have some insights into a number of the trends that you're seeing in terms of manufacturing in particular yep. Yep. In, in PCBs and electronics and things like that. Um, what I hear a lot about is PCB shortages and supply chain issues, but what, is, what are your um, views on some of the trends that you're seeing in this engineering industry and some of the concerns you, you have for, and some of the problems that engineers sure. can, can help solve here? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a large topic. I, if I could summarize for your audience, the biggest trend that I've seen in, in my 20 now, well, dare I say it's closer to 25 years of, of experience in this industry. And I've worked in all facets of it now. So the engineering side of it, the supply chain side of it, we talk about the semiconductor business. Um, and now obviously um, on, the, on the manufacturing side, when we talk about all of our customers are, are building a manufacturable product. So, and then that's sort of the last sort of mile um, of collaboration that, that we're dealing with, with our products, which I, I'll spare you the, the sales pitch. But the biggest single thing I would say I've seen uh, it, from an electrical engineering standpoint is what I call the rise of the all-purpose engineer. Mm. Um, and so, as I told you that story about having, you know, a calling to engineering, and, and most of us have a similar story, as I've said now multiple times, but I remember that very almost religious experience, that first thing I ever built, where you flip the switch and it did, it did exactly what, you know, you had anticipated it would do. And you remember very vividly going, I remember very vividly, man, I, I'm an engineer, like I've, I've accomplished something. And then yeah. 
I went and got our software first. friends call yeah. that their yeah. their hello world experience. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Hello world is very yeah, pretty much everybody puts on yeah. the screen. Um, although in my days the software wasn't as big a player as it is, but the, the lights sure. did the, in the sequence I expected them to, to turn on. And um, yeah. you know, I remember you know feeling very accomplished and oh my gosh, I, I did it. I'm an engineer. Well, then you go and you get your first job, and what you realize is that that's unfortunately not a large part of the job what you're really doing you're spending most of your time on these other elements chasing components um you know when i first got into this business electrical engineers didn't do board layout right um and there was a lot of specialties out you had manufacturing engineering available to you you had a um, component engineer available to you and you as an electrical engineer, you really drew a schematic. And in most cases, back in those days, you did it on a piece of graph paper. Um, and look, I'll just even tell you, I mean, this is the notebook I use on a daily basis. If you can see, it's graph paper. I mean, this yeah, is yeah, yeah. old habits die hard, right? Sure. As they say. Um, but what I've seen, the biggest trend is the engineer in themselves have really had to assume all of those roles. They are now the in many cases, a purchasing agent. They're certainly a component engineer. They're required to be a manufacturing engineer of sorts. Um, and of course, they got to be um, electrical engineer just in, in a traditional sense and the printed circuit board designer uh, all in one. And now what we see happening with um, data rates um, going the way they are is now even signal integrity engineering is now becoming the domain of the individual um, electrical engineer. So they're really becoming a renaissance sort of role, if you will. You really got to have to know a little bit about everything. Um, and the interesting thing to me about that, Jeff, is as it relates specifically to manufacturing, unfortunately, what we see happening is uh, we're going backwards. So as the engineers have been tasked with assuming more, they actually have less of the ability to absorb the knowledge because of the manufacturing being offshore. You know, when I was getting into this business, there was still a lot of manufacturing done locally. And in many cases, you could talk to the, to the, 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 the individual that was responsible for the manufacturing. Um, those days are gone. I mean, everything's manufactured somewhere else. Um, and you're lucky to get an email in many cases. But if you ask, and we talk to a lot of them, these folks that are applications engineers at these manufacturers, assembly houses, as well as board fabricators. Um, and you ask them a simple question, how many or what percentage of the boards that are delivered to you for manufacture go on hold? Because they're unmanufacturable, either because a component wasn't sourced correctly or no longer available, or more often than not, the engineer designed something that simply wasn't manufacturable. Um, you know, they vi violated a tolerance, as an example, or they produced a stack up that wasn't quite ideal, whatever the reason may be. I've had people tell me very specific numbers, but the most common response is all of them, all of them. Mm. So think about that. Every design that's submitted for manufacture is unmanufacturable. And, and that's because of this pivot that we've seen initially where the electrical engineer is being tasked with more and more stuff. But unfortunately, now obviously this is where I will do a bit of a sales pitch, unless you're using our products, um, the design process itself has not kept up. And the design experience is really the way I like to refer to it, has not been geared towards you, the designer or the engineer. It has been geared towards, in most cases, somebody with a financial um, interest, not a design interest. And those two things are at odds with each other. They really are. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm not a, an electrical engineer, but I've worked with electrical engineers um, who, who've done all the things you're talking about. And I did a little bit of board layout uh, in, in one class in, in, in school years ago. Sure. Um, but, but I'm thinking about the applications with some of the people that I, you know, my own experience and some of the people I work with, even in other engineering industries, in some cases, they're, they're, becoming kind of like what you say an all-purpose engineer where someone yep. needs to do the even a, a, you know mechanical engineering which is yep. the, the area i came from and you do mechanical design they're more uh tasked with doing software and, yep. and data analysis and going all the way to design for manufacturing that's correct and, and all sorts of things um some of the same supplier issues and sourcing the right materials and parts and stuff like that um and, and so it is interesting, um, you know, and, and it, 
you know, some companies will do that differently and specialize a little bit more, but this all purpose engineer is something that, that a lot of engineers can, um, can relate with no matter their domain. Yep. Right. And so, so what do you think is really the, the problems that might come of this or, or the things we need to be aware of if we think of, you know, their economic impacts or societal impacts as we think about this in particular in the, like, the manufacturing space yep. when we're working with physical products here? Well, I, look, I, I think we, I saw a major shift in 2008. Okay. Um, and that was the financial collapse, the financial crisis that we all experienced. Um, that was a significant change. And I'll, and I'll, and, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. Okay. Um, I was at a, I was just, I was, a, it was, a, I was a, either a salesperson here at L team at the time and, or an applications engineer. I usually did both roles at the same time. So yeah. um, I was calling on a, an account here locally in Southern California. I won't mention the name, but it, it was a record. You would recognize the name as a large semiconductor player, very large. Um, anyhow, I, I went up there and I had, as Altium has always done, at least since I've been involved with them, you know, we, we do business with the engineers themselves. We rarely, um, especially back in those days, did we call on an account. We always viewed the customer as the user. Um, on a one-to-one -one basis and, and no different. I um, had organized a meeting with one of the lead engineers at this company. Uh, I arranged to go up there and he had set it up so that we could have 12 or 15 of his colleagues in the room and do a song and dance. It was a sales pitch, okay? They were considering, they were, the engineers were considering moving um, to a new platform for printed circuit board design. Um, anyway, about halfway through the meeting, I thought it was going just swimmingly. Some gentleman walks in, I won't mention his name, um, but I didn't recognize him. I never talked to the guy before. He just sits down in the back of the room, attends the rest of the meeting, doesn't say a word. I end up finishing the meeting, putting my computer away and whatnot. And gentleman walks up, introduces himself. He says, oh, well, my name is fill in the blank. And uh, I handle vendor relations here. And uh, just so we're clear, your competitor provides me box seats at the Staples Center. And that was the end of the conversation. Um, now, let me fast forward. Today, that company is a significant customer of ours. Um, and that gentleman, to my knowledge, no longer has a job um, in vendor relations. And it's not because he wasn't a fine gentleman. Um, that was the biggest change we saw after the 2008 financial crisis. So previous 2008, people like that gentleman had a job because their number one focus when we talked about you know, design tools, design processes, um, was cost control. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's where you saw this big boom of PLM as an example, product lifecycle management, MRP, ERP, all these three-letter acronyms, TLAs, um, and you know, huge companies spawned around them. You know, famously, PLM was credited with saving Chrysler Corporation. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You know, the Grand Cherokee was the, developed for half the cost and half the time, et cetera, because of PLM. Um, now that, unfortunately, in the electrical engineering world, that focus on cost always came at the expense of design efficiency and speed. Mm. Okay, and in other words, well, we have to control cost. Design, design engineer, be damned. We're going to control those guys, and we're going to make sure they don't violate our process so that we can control cost. So you know, platform design, design reuse, those sorts of things. Well, once two thousand eight happened. And then the internet of things rose simultaneously, corporations moved away from that cost control and just said, fast. You gotta do it fast because we gotta beat our competitor. Um, and the cost control then came in the form of, now you're just gonna do all the jobs, right? So you can see all these things sort of colliding um, and that's the business we find ourselves in today, um, which is, you got to design fast, but you also need to design a manufacturable product. Um, and unless you got the right tools to do that, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Yeah, interesting. Um, how how so many of these things? So so even in like the last couple of years with COVID and, and yeah. supply chain shortages, has that taken another layer of this? What you're seeing? Um, well, what it did for us is be, and again I, I know this is not a commercial but obviously i'm very close to the products we developed we were sure. because we were 
let me put it this way. The engineer, electrical engineers are, are an interesting group of people in that they're on the vanguard of technology, but they resist change like nobody I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. Maybe that's <laughs> engineers in general. Yeah, that's okay. what I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's a weird sense. thing because they're tasked with innovation, but, but they hold on to things that they really care about. Correct. And I remember vividly in 2007, we released 3D. So you, you see the circuit board behind me. That's a screenshot out of our, our product. They embellished it, obviously. Our, our, our arts guys embellished it, but that's a screenshot out of our product. Um, but we released that in 2007. Previous to that, believe it or not, design PCB designs were done in 2D. I know for a mechanical engineer, that's mind blowing, but that's how it was done. Mm -hmm. And I remember we released it and I took hostile, I mean, Jeff, hostile phone calls from engineer after engineer saying, this is a gimmick. This is how dare you waste our, what we called maintenance dollars in those days. How dare you waste my maintenance dollars on this gimmick of 3D. You know, of course those, those, you know, the peanut gallery was only a, a, a little angry for a few weeks because then they quickly realized, oh, this is a game changer. But we had a similar experience with COVID because we had, a product that we had been developing, we had sort of shown to the public, but it was a SaaS product. So it was a cloud platform that um, was really to enhance the collaboration of those, what we call secondary stakeholders or, or um, you know, or, yeah, secondary stakeholders. So the primary stakeholder for us is the electrical engineer, or PCB designer. But then those secondary stakeholders are obviously people in the supply chain and people in the manufacturing column. Um, and so we had this product, we had been sort of marketing it and it wasn't released yet, but when COVID hit, it was March of 2019, remember vividly. Um, and we said, well, it's now or never because people need this product. And we released it. Um, and we got the same sort of initial reaction. People go on our forums and say, oh, well, you know, here you go, Altium trying to make a profit again. <laughs> you know, how dare they? <laughs> um, Clown computing, that was something that was used quite a bit. Um, but because the timing was such that it was such a needed thing, people adopted it like hotcakes. And our growth accelerated, believe it or not. We took a little bit of hit that first year as everybody did. Um, but other than that, we, we leaned into the, into the pandemic and we came out frankly, in a much better position, as did our customers and users came out in a far better position than they did before the pandemic, believe it or not. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So, so thinking about, um, you know, just how much the electrical engineering industry and electronics, like, have a, an influence in our world these days, yeah. you know, between what we use to communicate, what's hanging out in our pockets, mm -hmm. um, all the internet connected things, IOT and everything else. Like, like, like think about this, like how would you describe a world without the existence of electrical engineers and, and, and what this, what everything that, that we're able to deliver with electronic, you know, means these days. Well, look, Jeff, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, my, uh, I, I'm, the, I'm the type of guy that goes to the hospital and looks around and uh, fortunately what not for me, but I, you know, as you do, you need to you know, go to a hospital once in a while for you know, people that you're close to. But you, know, you, you get involved in, in, um, in some cases, very sort of detailed conversations about um, the medical condition, but you, you, but you look around and you go, well, well Look at this x-ray, look at this MRI, look at this CT scan, look at this, just something as simple as an infusion pump. These are all examples of customers that we have. But, you know, a lot of people say, look at the, 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 the wonders of modern medicine. And while I think we've learned a great deal about medicine, I really, I look at it and go, I really see really more the wonders of, of modern engineering, mm, um, yeah. you know, that have enabled us to make better decisions. Uh, Jay Leno is, a, is, a, is a, I'm a fan of his. He has a a YouTube show called Jay Leno's Garage. I don't know how much you know about Jay Leno, but yeah, yeah. he's got like 400 cars, right? He yeah, spent every yeah. dime of his mass fortune on cars. quite a collection. <laughs> yeah, he's got quite a, probably the biggest private collection in the world, be my guess. Um, but he also restores the cars. Anyway, but he says on his show quite often, he, I'm just enamored with this, but I'm, I'm sure that engineers can change the world. And I agree 100%. A thousand percent. I mean, if that's a group of engineers, 
say a thousand percent, but a hundred percent, I believe that, yeah, engineers have and will continue to um, change the world, impact the world, right or wrong, stop the end of something good, um, you know, solve all kinds of problems for us, or some engineering, some more rudimentary engineering challenge. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally there with you. You think about some of the big challenges that we have in the world, whether that's, that's energy, transportation, infrastructure, um, communications, all sorts of things like engineer and, and healthcare. You know, engineers are, are connected to the innovations that we need to save lives, improve lives, and, and you know, and even down to like feeding the world and, and yeah. you know, optimizing how we use sure. water resources and any Absolutely. other natural resources we have, like engineers are, are there. And, it's, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a great thing when engineers can be put in opportunities where they can do their best work um, and, and be given the support to, to become great and, and enabled to deliver the innovations. And also, you know, like we we're talking about a little bit, you know, they, they need to embrace change a little bit more th themselves yeah, yeah. sometimes and and look to find more innovation um, because the world and technology keeps changing. We need to be able to change and adapt with it. And that's that's part of the process. Well, and look, and, and Jeff, that's exactly right. And that's the and that's one of the, the things I saw after that 2008 financial crisis, which was and then the rise of the Internet of Things. Um, was it now finally what you saw were corporate cultures realizing this and saying, okay, you, we really need to focus on how do we, how do we, how do we sort of foster the engineering? How do we get that into, to be more productive and, and be more creative? And, and, and because, you know, this, this focus on cost that I mentioned previously, as I said, it came really at the expense of the design experience. And that's where you saw so disenchanted engineers, right? Because as I said, that, that religious experience they had when the lights come on or the hello world demonstration works, the only thing that's the, the antithesis of that, I should say, is when they get that job and they realize, well, crap, I'm, I'm not really allowed to design anything. You know, right. I'm really forced into this design process. And um, as I said, that's when we saw that happen is when our business accelerated, because as I mentioned to you before the, the meeting or the, or the interview, you know, look, man, nobody knew who we were in 2006, 2007. I know that because I made the calls and be like, I don't know who you are. Um, and so we, out of just pure survival, we decided that we were going to start calling on the engineers. They would take our calls. And then what happened in 2008 was all of a sudden those engineers that we were already talking to became the decision makers because these corporations said, look, I don't know what the hell you do every day, but we need you to do more of it. And you know, what do you need in order to get your job done more quickly and more efficiently and more creatively? And um, they would say, well, I need Altium Designer. And well, how much is it? Just go get it. And that was, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of our climb. So in many ways, um, you know, not only do I believe that engineers can and are and have changed the world, um, I've put that into practice in my business. Um, since for the past, well, almost 18 years, 19 years here, 18 years here at Altium, um, I've catered specifically to them. I do not market um, to corporations. I do not view my customers as the companies that we do business with. I, I view my customers, our customers, as the individuals that are using our products. And so everything we do is tailored to enhancing their experience. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, so you're talking a little bit earlier about like, hey, engineers come out of school and they realize, you know, they realize that getting into the corporate world and, and jobs is a little bit different. So, so you've worked with engineers as an engineer. You've you've collaborated with engineers in your company. Yeah. You, you you interact with a lot of engineers and in the in the work that you do, um, you know, over the last uh, yeah. many years. Um, so, from your perspective, what skills? Other than what, you know, the base technology skills and analysis skills that engineers learn in college, right? Um, what are those other mm -hmm. skills that can help engineers really thrive and, and succeed in their careers? So, look, a couple of things is most of the engineers we see coming out of school, um, electrical engineers now that we predominantly work with, obviously, um, woefully underskilled 
um, woefully underskilled when it comes to actually building a, or developing a product. Mm. Uh, most of them come out of school with a very solid um, underpinning of theory, the ability to, uh, you know, circuit function, the circuit that will work, simulate it in most cases. Um, but I'm just here to tell you, these kids coming out, of, young people coming out of school today, you're going to have to do your own board layout. So you might as well embrace it now. You're going to have to source your own components. You're going to have to second source most of your own components. So you might as well get familiar with how to navigate and, and understand uh, what the supply chain is telling you. Um, and as I said, I cannot understate how, how important it is to really understand the manufacturing process itself and what is achievable in manufacturing. Um, I, I, I correlate it or, or analogate it to very similar to the difference between like a, an architect and a civil engineer. Yeah. Our architects can you know, draw you a really fancy looking building, but that doesn't mean you can actually build it. Um, you know, the civil engineer, but you got to be both nowadays. Um, and so you got to lean into it. And the second thing I would say is what I find which is what drew me to the, what I call the dark side of, of engineering, which is the business side of it. Um, I don't care what you're doing, um, whether you're an engineer or you're a real estate agent, which is quite literally a sales job. Um, you really should invest in your, your ability to sell an idea. That, that is frankly how I've had any success in this business, be it as an electrical engineer in my early days or on the business side. If you can't sell somebody, just a colleague, on an idea, you're going to be very frustrated, particularly if you're one of the smarter people in the room, because you know you got the right answer. But if you can't sell it, it's going to be a frustrating career. So I highly recommend people that um, even if you just want to be a guy that sits you know, at a drafting desk and, uh, and you know, just leave me alone and, and I design stuff and that's what I do. It's going to be frustrating for you if you can't sell that idea. You you got to be able to do, it. and that's been proven to me time and time again in my career. And just because you're young, um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't forcefully try to sell your ideas. And if if you can get some professional guidance on that, even better. Yeah, we're all in sales to an extent, whether we like Absolutely. it or not. Uh, it's just it's just part of it. Um, like you said, whether you're selling an actual product or service yep. or an idea or kind of selling yourself if you're in a job interview, trying to you know, take the next step in your career, trying to sell the idea of a promotion, you know, take the next step, whatever that is, uh, we, need to, we need to sell uh, sell ideas if, if nothing else. So that's great, uh, great stuff. Well, Lawrence, this has been a fun conversation. At this point, we're gonna transition into the take action today segment of the show. Sure. We'll, we'll get one more final piece of actionable advice uh, from you. We'll be right back. Now it's time for a take action today segment of the show. Lawrence, this has been a fun conversation. We've covered a lot of ground, but as we end off here, what's the final thing that you would say to engineers, especially those who maybe are young in their careers, but they have some ideas that they or or, or data that really shows uh, something that they really want to push on or something that they feel like would really change things. What, what would you say to them? Don't give up easily. Um, you know, Jeff, there was a couple times in my career, one time specifically, I recall very early in my career, I was 25 years old. Um, I was just starting out, not only was I 25, but I was brand new to the business side of things. And I had an opportunity um, to make, at the time, would, would have been life change, some life changing money, not lottery type money, but it certainly at 25 years old would have been a life trajectory altering amount of money on a deal that I was involved in. Um, and something went a little bit sideways with that deal. And I had all the data as to why it was perfectly explainable, made perfect sense. Um, but the people that I was working with, whom were much older, much more experienced than I was, um, shut it down. Um, I never even presented my side of the case. I just took it. I just took it at face value that, well, these folks, I'm 25 years old. What do I know? Right. I'm just some guys new to business. I'm shoot. I'm a, I'm a design engineer. I'm not even a business person. Um, and, um, I, I let that deal slip through my fingers 
And um, so my advice to, 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 to young people just starting out in their careers, just because you're inexperienced um, and you may be young and new to the, new to the field, um, doesn't mean that you should give up easily. Um, you, you know, if you have the, be well-researched, um, always provide evidence for your opinions. Um, and if you have that on your side and you still firm, firmly believe that you're correct, then you need to be um, almost forceful in your conviction um, in, in, in trying to sell your case, which goes right back to the, to the last point from the previous segment of the interview, which is you got to learn to sell your ideas. And if you got the evidence to support it, don't give up. Don't give up at all. Yeah. Lawrence, that, that's great advice there as we think about, hey, you know, everyone's got value to share, like, like don't give up and, and be willing to speak up when, when it's the right time. So that's, that's great. Well, well, Lawrence, if people want to connect with you, learn more about you and Altium, where would you, where would you point them? Sure. Uh, so Altium.com, A-L-T-I-U-M.com. Um, that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Obviously, Jeff's the magic of the internet. <laughs> um, yes, if, if your folks want to contact me directly, that's pretty simple. My email address is Lawrence with a W dot Romine, which I'm assuming my name will be on the screen or in the notes below um, uh, at, at altium.com. So Lawrence dot Romine at altium.com. And I, um, unless you're just heckling me, I'll do my very best to, uh, to respond to every email I get, which, um, and I'm pretty good about that. So if anybody's got questions or, hey, if you're looking for a gig in, uh, in marketing, uh, and you're an engineer, we're always looking for folks. Um, or if you're an engineer and you're looking for a gig in engineering, we're also looking for those folks too. Yeah. So reach out to me. Yeah, very good. Well, thanks for a great conversation, Lawrence. Wish you and, and your team nothing but continued success. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. Appreciate it. I really hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and questions. You can go to www engineeringmanagementinstitute.org where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in the episode as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books that we mentioned. And don't forget to check out any upcoming live webinars also at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org. Additionally, for any engineers who are struggling and need help taking the next career step, I've created some free training resources with an opportunity to join a more intensive program called the Engineering Career Accelerator. You can find more information at engineeringcareeraccelerator.com. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering endeavors.